Greetings, everyone. This is Caroline Staten with Transition U.S., and thank you so much for joining our online event today. Our principal aim with these events is to provide practical support to the leaders of transition initiatives, those who are mulling over starting an initiative, and community leaders everywhere who are working on resilience building. We want to continue to offer the webinars at no cost, but do ask that you consider making a donation. We have a donation button on our website at transitionus.org, so thank you so much in advance for those of you who are able to do this. And without further ado, um, we're going to dive into our event today, and this is Building Community Resilience Through Courageous Storytelling. We have three guests with us. Uh, a shared story in history that gives a community a sense of itself, its struggles and lineage can be an important source of resilience. From its own experience, a community can draw examples and role models for bouncing back from hardships. And in this teleseminar today, we will explore, explore ways of developing our story as communities in transition, and how important fresh narratives can be for unleashing a coherent transition town initiative. Various guests are joining us for this conversation, and I'm going to introduce the three of them and turn it over to them for um, presentations and storytelling. And it, it will be uh, throughout their um, uh, tales that they'll call on questions or comments, and then we'll open it up more at the end as well. So Dwayne Elgin um, is an internationally recognized author, speaker, and media activist. His books include The Living Universe, Promise Ahead, Voluntary Simplicity, and Awakening Earth. He's done research on the long-range future since the early 70s while working as a social scientist on a presidential commission on the American future. And in 2006, Duane received an International Peace Award in recognition of his contribution to global vision, consciousness, and lifestyle. Um, his current work involves bringing together more than a dozen great transition stories and there's a wonderful website called greattransitionstories.org. And Dwayne's personal website is dwayneelgin.com. That's our first guest. Um, Jeff, Jeff Vanderkloot is a spark in a growing movement to build a world defined by compassion, happiness, and thriving, resilient local communities. He's the executive director of New Stories, a nonprofit that supports cultural transformation through changing the stories we tell. Jeff is also a co founding editor of Great Transition Stories. And he's a serial entrepreneur and former software engineer. He advises for profit and nonprofit organizations and serves on various boards, including the Compassionate Action Network International, the Happiness Initiative, and new stories. Um, his, uh, his website is jeff.vanderkloot.com and also newstories.org. And all of this is also on our website, everyone. Um, Claire Hines, our third guest, has been actively engaged in research and action to build a thriving rural and local economy develop a stronger local food system, and build a sense of community celebration around sustainability work. Oh, boy, in that area that you're going to have to tell us how to pronounce that, Claire. <laughs> shores, what is it? It's called Shawamigan. Thank you. Shawamigan Bay on the shores of Lake Superior in Wisconsin. And Claire also runs Elsewhere Farm based on production permaculture in Herbster, Wisconsin. So welcome, you three talented individuals. So looking forward to um, hearing about storytelling today and courageous storytelling for resilience. So I'm turning it first over to you, Dwayne, and welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Caroline. It's just such a uh, treat to be here uh, with this community and with these uh, with these uh, co-presenters, and I'm really looking forward to this. Let me start with a story. 
uh, about my growing up uh, and how it affected our community. I grew up in Idaho, uh, a couple of miles outside of town on a little uh, on a farm, um, out of, uh, outside of a little town in Idaho, about 500 people. And once a year, one weekend a year, uh, those 500 people would put together a uh, a charity auction. And there would be thousands of people that would pour in 20, 30 miles away from all around the surrounding communities to that weekend auction, bake sale, and charity event. Charity event. It, was, it was a community happening. And so this little town had a notorious reputation as being a, uh, a generous place and a uh, really a strong sense of community spirit uh, to give back. Um, so that really, uh, I mean, I just saw that every year. It just every year that would come around. And so I grew up with a strong sense of the capacity for community to really pull together and give back. And uh, so when we're looking at great transition towns or, or towns in transition, I know we can do this. Uh, that's how I grew up. Um, so let me just step back quickly and just for a minute uh, to look at the bigger uh, picture of transition uh, because I've spent the last 40 years or so looking really at that. And, um, and I just want to affirm that this is a time of great uh, transition, not just transition, but great transition. Uh, we've had uh, the rise and fall of empires throughout uh, history, the Roman Empire, the, the Mayan, the Aztec uh, uh, the Russian Empire, and, and so on. Um, what we have never had is the prospect of the entire Earth civilization being at risk. And with climate uh, disruption and species extinction and running out of cheap oil and uh, unsustainable populations and all the rest, we are converging into a situation, I think, a perfect storm of a world and systems crisis. Now, one thing that means is that the underlying narratives or stories that every civilization holds of itself is going to be put into question. And we are going to be, because all of those stories are partial. They don't look at the whole world in a, in a process of transition. So uh, the frontiers have closed, the, the circle is closed. We, it absolutely requires a new kind of story. And if it requires that at the global level, it cascades right on down to the very local level, to the personal level, and then um, right beyond that to the more at the community uh, level. So as I look ahead, I am seeing the convergence of these powerful trends, probably by the 2020s. And I anticipate a world moving into a prolonged systems crisis and breakdown, which is really a time of breakthrough. And part of the breakthrough is recreating ourselves at a more basic level, at the level of neighborhoods and communities, and creating local living economies at that scale that really uh, use the power of, of um, you know, the psychological and social glue of, of our collective narrative to kind of hold us together in these times of, of really great stress and transition. So uh, stories may seem really removed uh, from <laughs> the challenge of, uh, well, do we have enough food? Is, is uh, water going to be sufficient? And so on. Story may seem far removed, but story is that which underlies uh, the collective intention to get together and build those uh, capacities for resilience uh, for a longer term uh, future. So I could come back, you can hear my <laughs> enthusiasm for this. Uh, it's just really um, uh, something I've lived in in different ways. I've lived in uh, co-housing and such, and I've seen the power of community once again, the power of story in that community to hold that together and lead it into um, actions in the world. So um, that is the larger context uh, that I see a whole world in current transition. And so then that cascades down to um, uh, a more local level. And the work that Jeff Vanderclute has been doing, I've been following for years. And uh, Jeff 
is an amazingly uh, courageous soul and bringing his capacity for harmonizing all of these conflicting forces together to look for a higher level of possibility. And that's exactly the kind of challenge that we face as I see it in communities. There are all of these conflicting forces. We have to bring them together in a higher level of possibility. And he is working on the tools and the processes uh, of doing that. So I'd like to turn uh, now to Jeff to uh, share. Thank you, Dwayne, and thanks everyone for being here. And I also want to just express my joy for being part of this conversation, which feels deeply important as we do the on-the-ground work of movement building and transitioning the world uh, to a thriving and resilient now, actually. Not just a future, but how do we live into that now? So I thought I would start with just some comments on Marshall Ganz's uh, framework for changing culture by changing the story. And he worked uh, intimately with the Obama campaign to help win the 2008 election. And his simple framework has three pieces. Uh, the story of self, why were you, me, why were we as individuals called to what it is that we've been called to? Then there's the story of us. What is our constituency, the community, the organization? What have we collectively been called to? What's our shared purpose? What are our goals and shared vision? And then there's the story of now. So what is the challenge that we are facing as a community? And what are the choices that we can and must make? And what is the hope that we aspire to? Um, I was attracted to story in many ways. Somewhat unconsciously at first, I was attracted to the organization New Stories because I felt there was something alive there. And subsequently, I learned about Danella Meadows' 12 leverage points, which is another model for how change happens. And with the 12 leverage points, there are various ways of intervening in a complex system. And some of them have more leverage, and some of them at least seem to have less leverage. And when I think about society, it is a complex system par excellence. So how, how do we shift culture? How do we not just change culture a little bit? How do we radically transform culture? We would need to radically transform the story. And the only way that I can begin to get my small mind around that vast possibility is to start with the story of self. And, and that may be indeed the reason why we have to start with our own story. Do we even know our own story? Are we capable of telling our story? There's a wonderful uh, white paper that I've put on the greattransitionstories.org website that everyone on this call can refer to. I think we'll distribute the URL after the call. There are a whole bunch of resources that we've pulled together. So this is a white paper that walks you through a process of getting clear on your own story, getting clear on the collective story, and the story of now, and then actually the fourth step is, of course, getting into action. So the story of, of me, really briefly. Uh, didn't start well, uh, certainly came from a privileged background, I would say, in the Washington, D.C. area, but always felt, perhaps because I was an only child, who knows, uh, I could make things up, but uh, I always felt that, that I was uh, a misfit, and that became my identity. So if there was a community, my definition of myself was I'm not in it. And so for 33 years or so, uh, I had a difficult relationship with the collective, did well in school, uh, found my way by luck into a successful startup company called Tripod in the mid-90s, which surfed the first wave of the Internet. <clears throat> and I was fortunate enough to be in a position to learn to write software on the fly with uh, the early web and create an application called the Homepage Builder, which expanded into a whole personal publishing and proto-social networking platform that uh, connected 35 million people to one another and gave a voice to the voiceless. So this was my first experience with how the new media can be radically empowering and, and bring about um, a shift at a global scale. So I was on the path of creating virtual community, but still in the physical world considered myself to be outside of community. So there was an interesting paradox emerging. Over the course of seven or eight different startup companies, I wrote software, eventually writing a platform with the express intention of connecting the global heart 
and creating a healing environment for people to uh, connect with one another and share your story. Literally, that was our tagline. So there were a lot of premonitions for this work, even going back a decade or so. I was actually, to continue sort of fleshing out the the darker part of the story, which is what makes this maybe a courageous story for me to be telling. In 2002, I was diagnosed with, uh, with bipolar 2, uh, which is the, the less psychotic form. And uh, it was perhaps because of just the accumulation of difficulties uh, that I was experiencing that I was beginning to exhibit the symptoms. I took that as a turning point. Uh, finally, I could see my past. You know, you can almost map this onto a world in transition. I can see, I could see a past that, that I wanted uh, to part from and create a future distinct from that past. So it became a line in the sand, and I focused my full attention on healing individually. It took a number of years uh, for that process of healing to unfold, and um, certainly at this point, any of the symptoms that contributed to the diagnosis seem to be long gone. So I would say there's profound potential in our individual story and our individual healing. And then there is even more profound potential when we bring that to the story of us. So a few years ago, I relocated to, well, I began to visit the Pacific Northwest because I had a sense that community works here. I had been living in Palo Alto, which is the belly of the beast for Silicon Valley. And lots of great things happen there. Facebook is there and Actually, Facebook is doing some amazing things in the field of compassion, specifically around bullying. So, you know, there's a lot of light that is coming from Silicon Valley, but I was not experiencing that in 2009. In fact, uh, school children, high school students were routinely, I, I'm, fr- I'm sorry to say, but routinely jumping in front of the Caltrain and committing suicide to the point where they stopped announcing when this would happen because more students would then be inclined to do that as a way of getting attention for their individual cries for help. And when I discovered the Pacific Northwest in the summer of 2009, I had a totally different vibe. I committed myself to uh, exploring that, uh, to connecting with elders and mentors here to try to understand. And that was the beginning of my shift into physical community. I've since relocated here. Uh, I've got a lovely little apartment in downtown Langley on Whidbey Island. Uh, It is in a sort of nascent co-housing situation. I now feel very comfortable in community. Uh, I've been working with the Thriving Communities Movement, which is very much like transition, maybe just a different name, but that's sort of what we've been calling it here. And um, 30 or so communities in the Pacific Northwest and beyond have come together in a kind of network to explore what would it mean for us to be fully thriving, to really go for it, to be holistically well, across the board, and we've been developing a common, very positive, overwhelmingly appealing vision of the future that we can all work towards. So, you know, the story of us would go something like, uh, we want to be thriving, we see the potential for that in our communities, we also see the challenges, we believe we have everything that we need to uh, address those challenges and uh, work with those who have been ostracized, marginalized, who are underserved by our community, and really Uh, together and move forward as a whole into optimal collective health. So something along those lines. Another story of us offered by a friend uh, and hereditary chief, Phil Lane Jr., who lives in British Columbia. He has a vision for this region in which the peoples of the earth come back together under the tree of life to share their gifts and all that they have learned during this period of turmoil and separation from one another. And the vision that he describes maps so neatly onto a vision that New Stories has been cultivating for a thriving and resilient Salish Sea bioregion. Salish Sea is the name of Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia up in British Columbia, seeing that as a common waterway, seeing it as a unified whole and working collectively across cultures with indigenous people, all of us, to bring about a restoration of the bioregion. And then that brings us to the story of now. What is the challenge that we're facing? I guess I've spoken a bit to that. We're facing the depletion of fish stocks, pollution in Puget Sound, ocean acidification, the list goes on and on. 
the, the Northwest is one of two regions in the United States that is not projected to become a drought zone with uh, climate change. So we're going to have a massive influx of people and industry, especially industry that needs water. How will we address those challenges consciously? We have to come together in unprecedented unity in order to, uh, to achieve that end. So those are some remarks just borrowing heavily from Marshall Gans's frame and maybe we'll come back to some of those ideas a little later in the call. And with that, I would love to pass the baton to Claire, who has a perspective on hyper-local organizing and how to restory our local communities. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I am really delighted to be here today uh, with all of you. Um, just briefly, a little bit about uh, my own story. Um, I am an I, I'm a native of Chicago uh, and moved to northern Wisconsin, very rural northern Wisconsin on the shore of Lake Superior uh, to start a farm. And um, the region that I live in now is um, one of the first eco municipalities in the country, uh, or the, actually the first eco municipality region in the country. Uh, and it has a long history of sustainability work, you know, probably 20, 25 years of, of organizing around sustainability. And one of the things that we're um, focusing on now um, as we're a community of the gateway to enormous um, natural abundance, uh, Lake Superior, the Pinocchio Hills, um, it's just a, an incredibly rich region. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of pressure coming down on us uh, now as things become destabilized. Um, and so one of the current um, conversations here is how is it that we broaden the dialogue, uh, broaden it beyond the people who, um, for who, or who, who know what, uh, who, who identify with the word sustainability, who are, have been working on environmental issues or social justice issues or thriving local economies for a long time. How do we broaden this? Uh, to include a bigger group uh, because it's going to take everybody and everybody's gifts to move forward. Um, and so as I was thinking about preparing for this call, uh, that was on my mind uh, and also um, it's so, re you know, so immediately relevant to what was going on here in Schwamigan Bay. So I want to tap um, four, four of the bigger stories that, that Jeff and Duane have touched on a little bit the idea of celebration, the idea of interconnectedness, the idea of um, the, the idea of compassion. Because I think these are very critical stories uh, and stuff to hold on to when we start to face stress and challenge. Um, and I think those things make the difference between uh, what we can do successfully over the long term uh, as activists, as, as change agents, um, and and not having those stories, um, I, I think, is part of the challenge. When I see, you know, I've been working with uh, environmental groups for probably 20 years, and where people burn out um, or when things implode, um, is usually because we've we've tried to do something that we really care about, but we've tried to do it in an old story, um, an old story of competition or scarcity or um, uh, singularity um, or, or just conflict. And so to, to change that story, to change it to celebration, to change it to aliveness and compassion and interconnectedness is critical um, on all of the levels from, from national and international to, to personal um, to, to the present. Um, and so to talk about, just to, to start with, and then we'll open it up for more conversation, is to give you some really specific um, examples of uh, how stories are playing out all over the country in different ways that are creating bigger boundaries, widening the boundaries, both internally um, and also in a community. And there, there are some really lovely examples of that all over the place. And uh, I'm kind of riffing off of the early idea in Transition Towns uh, where you write a newspaper story from the future talking about how a community changed and, and some of the pivot points in that change. And, it, and it's a made up story, but it's one that's, you, that's sort of compelling, that's a vision that a community can work towards. Um, so I was trying to think about, okay, well, 
we've got those written stories. But how is it that we can um, also change the media a little bit um, so it's not always a written word? So I want to give you a couple of examples. And if you signed up early, you got a handout um, of this uh, that I'm going to talk about. If you uh, signed up closer to the call time, um, I'm sure this is going to go out afterwards, and I'm sure it will be available on the website. So you'll have um, links from that handout uh, that you can go to different websites that talk about all the things I'm, I'm going to mention right now. Um, and Claire, one of the, Claire, yeah. This is Caroline. Just to let people know that um, that handout is on our website now. Great, uh, great. If you go to our home page and click on this event, it will take you to the page that talks about the event and your handout is posted there. And I was going to mention it earlier and forgot to do that, so thank you, Claire. No worries. No worries. That's great. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I'm, I'm looking at right now is creative placemaking. And so I'm, I'm talking about storying in terms of those terms, creative placemaking. The way we, we create change in a community is because we, we care about it, and, and we also have given it a kind of meaning, which is our story. Um, and that really, those two things together um, lead us to actively uh, do something about the challenges we face um, and create something different. Um, we need, and and act, I'm, I'm emphasizing activity because it's easy to know something about a place but never actually get to the point of doing something about it. So, so as we start to ask uh, who is our community, um, who is outside of the bounds of our community, um, these, these are where, places where we want to change the story um, and um, find common ground of attachment and meaning and create some new common ground. We um, filter um, our, our motivations for change through what we know about local ecology, what we lo know about lo local social systems, um, through our own experiences, um, through our, our friends and relations, and through the way that we think about ourselves. Um, Jeff kind of touched on that when he was talking. Um, and so all of those, at all of those points, we can shift the story. Um, and so we're looking at shaping values and meanings and emotional bonds with a place in a way that we can empower people. That's what creative placemaking is about. Um, and we're storing ourselves into a new connection with each other, with our land, with our towns and cities and our neighborhoods, um, and all of those places uh, that, we, that we need to connect together. So these are nine examples of, of different uh, ways in which that's happening. The first is from my own region. Um, I live just north of something called the Pinocchio Hills, a uh, very old mountain range, um, and it is uh, full of iron. And right now um, there is a, a lot of conversation about um, what's going to happen with those hills. Uh, there's a mining company that um, basically, uh, to put not too fine a point on it, gutted the state's uh, regulatory process around environmental standards um, in order to uh, make sure that it was going to be permitted to move in um, to mine the iron out. And there's uh, an incredible community response happening here now um, in a way that um, has really inspired me um, just to think about how we do build place uh, and, and sense of place in a, in a welcoming way. So one of the things that's happened is that uh, we had an event called the Pinocchi Read. Um, and we have a, a theater in uh, Washburn, which is on the shore of Lake Superior. It's a town of about 2,000 people. And um, we have had uh, different writers reads um, every so often, every six months or so at this theater uh, about any subject, <clears throat> lots of different subjects. This time it was about the Pinocchio Hills. And uh, so people in the community uh, submitted stories and poems about the value of the Pinocchio Hills to them. And then they came together uh, to read those stories. <clears throat> and what was so powerful about that evening <clears throat> was that um, it was ordinary ordinary people in the, in the community who um, sh spoke from the heart about growing up here, about growing up in mining families, about growing up uh, and, and being in the hills, about growing up uh, the, the Bad River Reservation uh, of Ojibwe Anishinaabe is right on the shore uh, by the Pinocchis, um, growing up native. And 
the story that was being told that night was about the Pinocchio Hills as alive, about the Pinocchio Hills as being part of our community. And um, that's a very different paradigm than about the Pinocchio Hills being a resource to be taken. Um, and if you are interested in hearing some of the stories, I've included on that handout two links to both a written version of the story and um, the entire evening was um, taped and broadcast on WRNC, which is our local radio station. So you can, if you want to hear those stories, you can hear them. But what was powerful about that night was the diversity of voices uh, that spoke, um, uh, and, and, and all local voices, and um, it, the, the eloquence that came out of people um, when they talked about their care for the, the place was, was just uh, mind-boggling to me. So um, in the way that we tell stories uh, to celebrate where we are, that starts to build bridges. Um, and that's, that's one example of, of uh, creative storytelling. City Repair is an organization uh, in Portland, Oregon, to go to the, <laughs> to the other side of the country um, that perhaps some of you have heard about. Um, and I've included, again, the website um, on the handout. But this is an organization that works to revitalize neighborhoods. Um, and one of the projects that I love that they have is to overtake intersections. Um, so intersections sometimes can um, be a source of lots of accidents. Uh, there, there are lots of traffic moving there, typically um, not generally a place where you would think of uh, a neighborhood gathering space. Uh, but they've started this project where they've painted intersections and um, as, as a traffic calming measure, but it's also ended up working as a little bit of a gathering space for different neighborhoods in Portland and um, in a way of reclaiming neighborhoods uh, for people <laughs> as opposed to cars. And so uh, City Repair, um, as an organization, asks a number of questions. How can the private and public be effectively merged to co-create the world we want to live in? How can modern technology and traditional methods work symbiotically instead of being at odds with each other? Um, how can um, the ways in which we conduct our interpersonal relationships, um, how, how are those ways conducive to building communities? How can we create diverse communities that support and nurture the, the uniqueness of each member? So this is an organization that um, has um, quite a few initiatives happening in Portland um, but as a great example of using art to tell a story. And it's not a story that's being told to the community. It's a story that the community itself is creating in the process of creating this artwork. Um, and that's a really important point, that the community itself is generating that story. Uh, the next example I want to move to is um, a arts, another arts organization called Heart of the Beast Puppetry in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, and again, this is art as community building. This organization does a lot of street performances and uh, neighborhood block parties uh, on National Night Out, which is a night to um, celebrate peace in neighborhoods and, and bring together communities and the um, police force. Um, they had a, a street dance with puppets. And um, there's some videos on their website is, are, are, are linked there. But um, it's, it's an amazing organization uh, in terms of getting people to connect on an artistic level, but also on a level of movement. And um, so as you think about tools for your own communities, one of the things you can think about is how is it um, that we can bring you know, that kind of sense of fun and irreverence um, and uh, just wonder to the process. And puppets are a really great way to do that. And plus, the creation of puppets is also a way to bring a community together. So that's an organization you can check out. Um, another example, um, a radio example, is um, something that uh, someone was telling me about called Intervention Day <laughs> from Boulder, Colorado. In the 1980s, they had a broadcast. And the premise was that aliens came to planet Earth. There was this galactic council of aliens that said, Earth is losing it, and you guys better get your act together. Uh, and so um, they imposed sanctions on the planet <laughs> and said, you will be sustainable. Um, and so the whole um, process of figuring out how we were going to be sustainable um, uh, was, was celebrated on this radio broadcast. And so you can see a little bit. I wasn't able to find the whole broadcast, but um, you can see a little bit from the website. 
But I loved that idea that um, we can use radio as a means of bringing the community together and telling uh, very fun stories, inventive stories. The broadcast won the 1987 International Radio Festival of New York Grand Award for Best Entertainment Program of the Year. Um, so very imaginative program. Um, a piece of uh, switching gears again to the, to the other coast, New York, um, a piece of artwork that um, anybody can replicate that I just love. Um, it, it, lots of construction happening in cities, uh, lots of boards up covering over construction sites. And somebody posted uh, these posters uh, on a construction site. And there's, it's a black and white poster. On the one, it has two hands, um, as if you had put your hands in paint and stuck them on a piece of paper. On the one side, it says, place your hand here. On the other side, it says, under the other hand, or over the other hand, it says, have stranger place hand here. And on the bottom of the poster, it says, remove hands when no longer strangers. And um, <laughs> so this, this exercise takes a bit of courage because you have to pull somebody off the street that you don't know, get them to put their hand on the poster next to yours, which means you have to stand close to each other, and then talk to them for five minutes um, until you're no longer strangers. Um, but what a lovely way of, of utterly spontaneously bringing together people who might never otherwise talk to each other, and especially in a city where, where it's mm -hmm. so taboo to even look somebody in the eye, let alone talk to them. Uh, it's just a great example of radically inviting people to build community. The artist, uh, Ryan Brennan, has uh, his own website. You can see uh, there's a review of this um, street art uh, on another website that you can check out. And he's also got other what he calls living exercises. Um, he's got a book of exercises. So if you're interested in creative placemaking tools, that's one that you might check out. But such an easy thing to create. Um, just a couple quickly other, other um, examples to spark your creative juices. One, uh, I'm, I'm, as I, live, I mentioned, I live in a very rural area, and that often gets overlooked in a lot of sustainability work. Uh, one group that's working on revitalizing the sense of rural America is called the Art of the Rural. And they celebrate rural arts and rural living um, and the richness of rural life. So what they're doing is changing the story from rural America as being an impoverished place or being a place where um, nobody thinks or being a place where there isn't anything to do. Uh, and they're changing that story very dramatically uh, to show the richness of rural life. Um, that's a, a source you can check out. Going completely mobile <laughs> um, is another direction to, to, to consider. Um, and the Cleveland Historical Society um, used a phone app to put stories about Cleveland history um, on, on, a, on a map that you can click on as you're walking around town. And, um, and then they've uploaded different stories about the community. And um, what a lovely tool for visitors to uh, any of our areas and to think about how we could create um, tours of sustainability for each of our communities so that people who are traveling through can connect right away with things that they really value about um, you know, green space and um, sustainably produced food and examples of energy, renewable energy, and examples of uh, creative wastewater management and all of those things that uh, we can show off about our communities. Uh, and then a couple of really general um, tools to think about Innovation salons um, are very simple once a month gatherings. Anybody can come, and your only goal is to talk about innovative ideas. Um, we've started those here in Chalamagan Bay, and they're incredibly fun evenings. Um, somebody makes a pot of soup, and we just talk in the evening um, about new ideas. And um, it's a place where a lot of entrepreneurship is being born. <laughs> and that, uh, in, in an area that doesn't think of itself as generating entrepreneurs, um, it's amazing to see the creativity coming out of just getting together and having conversation about, well, what if we could do this? Um, so that's another example. Uh, another uh, smaller tool to think about, just a kind of fun way to mess with, uh, again, communication, is something we're calling the chalkboard campaign. Uh, so think about installing chalkboards in in your community in different places. 
Um, and one of our challenges as a community is, you know, we have our routes and our routines, and we don't generally uh, deviate too much from those things. And so, to put chalkboards up all over the community in different places, um, and leave them blank for a while. Uh, don't give out chalk to go with them. Just leave them blank and see what happens. Um, and if nothing shows up on those chalkboards after a while, perhaps right in the corner of the chalkboard, got chalk, and then see what happens. Um, and maybe a little bit later, uh, a couple weeks go by, maybe provide chalk and see what happens. And uh, this, is, this is completely unregulated, spontaneous, un no predicting what might come up on these chalkboards. But um, amazing conversation can ensue <laughs> when you give people a space to do it. And we don't always have enough public spaces to have conversation. And this is one way to do that. You can take regular photos of what shows up on the chalkboard and post it to a website. Um, you can give the address someplace near the chalkboard. And um, also perhaps make it possible for other people to upload pictures of things that show up on the boards. So you, again, you are you're widening who has control of the story. Um, and other people can just add to it. And then it becomes a force of its own. Um, and, and it keeps rolling forward. So that's just very briefly a, 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 a toolbox of um, techniques you can use to think about how to create some new stories and, and really radically shifting the boundaries of who's telling the story, who is the story about, um, and um, what is the story being told. So uh, with that, I will turn it back to Duane uh, for our next step. We would love to hear some questions and conversation. Um, and uh, examples perhaps from your own communities about um, storytelling and new stories and um, tools for that. Um, so Dwayne, back to you. Wow. Claire, thank you so much. That was an extraordinary uh, overview and uh, so rich. And, I, and, I'm, uh, and I'm hoping <laughs> we're going to get a lot of this. Uh, available on the, on the website. And I know Jeff was doing some work to um, make that possible as well. And um, I want to open it up to uh, uh, questions and comments from uh, our, our many partic participants here. And um, I really, I just, I, I'm just so um, enthused <laughs> by the conversation uh, with Claire and Jeff and Carolyn. Caroline, before uh, we, we open it up to um, uh, the whole audience, I want to ask you as the uh, director here of Transition US, I hope I have that correct, do you have any stories you want to share? Living there in Sebastopol up here in Northern California, are there any, is there anything that you feel inspired to uh, contribute to the conversation? Thanks, Dwayne. I, I, I I do have something that um, I think sort of gave me my visceral introduction to the Transition Towns movement. And it happened when I went to the first reskilling festival that was held at a local farm in Sebastopol. And I had thought that I was going to an event where there would be many instructors and people coming that wanted to learn those things that the instructors had to offer. And of course, that is part of it. There were people uh, talking about beekeeping and raising chickens and making uh, really rich compost and uh, grandmother's favorite brine and all sorts of things. And there were probably about 200 people and different series of workshops, so uh, maybe six or seven concurrent throughout the day. And um, that was very rich in terms of people sharing what they're passionate about to audiences of peers who really wanted to learn that particular thing. So that's, you know, that's the texture. But what really happened and what I really noticed was that people met each other and they found out that their kids went to the same schools. They found out that people lived you know, around the corner. Um, all of this other um, uh, 
texture and weaving happened during that reskilling festival. I saw so many people uh, swapping phone numbers and making um, coffee dates and um, and willing to have a, a number of people come over to see firsthand how their bees were doing and to give them, you know, extra added help and um, just all sorts of other things. And of course, there was, you know, community meal that was shared. But what I realized is that I had thought I was going to something to learn some things. But what I really experienced was that I was witnessing firsthand community being built before my eyes, and it was so moving. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, that to me is sort of the essence of, the, of this work. I think we're all doing the essence of this transition work is it's really building those relationships and creating opportunities for those relationships to be built. Um, so that to me, again, just a, a nugget of when it really hit home, I was like, wow, here, here a number of us are thinking it's one way, but really it's much, much deeper. So that, that's my story <laughs> for today. Mm -hmm. Over to you, Dwayne. <laughs> Uh, Wayne, do we have you? Yeah, can uh -oh. you hear me? Oh, can yeah, you hear me there. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, for the, for sharing that. Um, that has a very familiar feel uh, to it. Now, I would like to open it up. We have an amazing uh, community of people here. I know a number of people that are on the uh, call. I can see their names. And so uh, I just want to open it up and... Um, uh, begin to call on folks. And Caroline, can you handle that to click on the right person at the right time? Who would raise your hand if you if you can? Do, do you press one? Is that it, uh, Caroline? Yes. To, yeah. Exactly. Press one on your keypad if you'd like to uh, add a comment about community building and resilience building uh, through story making. Uh, we'd love to hear from uh, folks. So go ahead and press one on your keypad, and Caroline will will see you when I'm add a comment to the conversation. And don't be shy. Um, <laughs> no. um, bring, bring your Particularly comment. because we will call on you if you can. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Great. We have someone that's breaking the ice. Ooh, good. Courageous that, souls. That is um, Pauline. Go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you very much. This has been so right up my alley, all this storytelling for community, and I'd just like to share something that um, that I was involved in several years ago. I live on a small island in the Salish Sea, and uh, I, decided, I saw that the people that were telling the stories here were the developers, and I thought it was time to, um, to expand the story. So I wrote a musical about the island, and I created a three-day festival uh, that we'd hear the stories of the plants, the stories of the rocks, and Anyway, it was a fantastic event. It kind of wore me out. And I did it uh, the second year, and you could just see the, the tone of the island was changing. The conflicts were decreasing, et cetera. But, you know, that was, uh, let's see, that's seven years ago. And I understand the storytelling has to go on because I feel like we're, we're in another place where something, it, the storytelling is, just needs to go on to to keep that uh, the shift happening. Mm, that's fantastic. Thank you. Now I know we had um, golly, we've got a number of other folks that are uh, ready to offer. Uh, Caroline, can you? Yes. Um, let's go to Claudia next. Claudia, go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much. This is so inspiring. And what I wanted to add was that uh, we are, you know, uh, uh, looking at doing working groups, starting things, and uh, they tend to be uh, very involved projects that take a lot of time, and it, it can get to feel uh, overwhelming. And what I have learned uh, today, and also the 
uh, sustainability uh, um, group in Seattle is that uh, they did a lot, a lot of these uh, small projects that were community building, but that didn't take a lot of time to set up and and uh, develop. So um, I think that's such a good idea for us to to have a, a lot of small things that that. Uh, that build community and resilience. So thanks for that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Claudia. We'll go to Ron next. Um, this is Ron on Lopez Island, another island in the Salish Sea. And um, one thing that we've been doing here that's very timely is called Procession of the Species, where on Earth Day there's a big parade of everybody who wants to dressing up like bees and giraffes and elephants and uh, and and it's just a, a wonderful sense of spontaneous um, community with everybody doing very creative um, wearable art and uh, parading around our village. Wonderful. I want to come up and join that. Well, why don't you? It's uh, <laughs> next Saturday. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Anne, um, you you pressed four on your keypad. So I'm wondering, do you have a, a comment or a question? Um, Anne, that could have been an accident. Um, so we'll we'll see. Anne, if you want, you can press uh, your keypad again if you do have something. And um, we have Ben Roberts. Hi there, Ben. Go ahead. Hi, Caroline. Hi. <laughs> nice to be here with my good friends Dwayne and Jeff, and it was really um, wonderful to hear the, the third speaker, too, who's, I'm sorry, your name is slipping my mind, um, but I love all those examples. Claire. Yeah. Um, very, very exciting, and, and I'm left... This is something I just I wrestle with a lot. I've heard Charles Eisenstein talk about it too. The sense that that the story the story of the people, the grand story of where we are and where we might be going, um, that really resonates with mainstream society, maybe hasn't we hasn't fully been been expressed. We haven't found the new story at that level that that works beyond, you know, kind of the smaller groups where we can all sort of share a sense of urgency and um, and also perhaps a possibility for this great transition that, that most people, you know, for example, here in Newtown, Connecticut, where I live, don't really get. I mean, you know, we had a small transition group that, that um, or, you know, initiating group that, that tried to get going and didn't get a lot of traction. And so I'm wondering, you know, where our thoughts are on, on on a story that calls us powerfully to act and yet also doesn't rely on hope for change that, that somehow feels unrealistic or insufficient to the scope and scale of the challenges we face. I think that's where we get, where we get caught. Um, I think we need something other than hope to drive us is maybe where I'm going. A story that doesn't rely on hope um, but mm. nourishes us at some deeper level as connected human beings. So mm. I'll at that. <laughs> And uh, Jeff, you wanted to respond to Ben, I see. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I've been mulling over what is a story of now that is inspiring based on what is actually happening around the world in a way that we can then connect with and get on board. So a couple of examples, and I can keep it brief, I think. Um, I'm on the board of the Compassionate Action Network International, which includes the Charter for Compassion, which is a document essentially uh, articulating the golden rule and noting that the golden rule in one form or another appears in all the world's major religions and moral and ethical traditions. So it's not just a religious thing. And there are about 100,000 people who have signed the charter online. The charter came out of the TED Prize, so that's pretty mainstream. TED awarded $100,000 to create this founding document. And since then, whole cities and soon possibly even states and countries will be affirming the Charter for Compassion, which is to say making compassion and the golden rule 
a top priority very publicly. So the, the city of Seattle was the first to do so. The mayor and city council unanimously signed personally the charter and then as a collective, again, the story of us, uh, issued a proclamation committing Seattle to become a more and more and more compassionate place over the next 10 years. So how that will play out, that's a collective process. We have to all uh, live into the city of Louisville, Kentucky is a shining star as a compassionate city. The Dalai Lama will be there next month. Uh, there's a lot of work there to actually embody the principles of compassion and the golden rule. We have about 130 cities around the world that are looking to potentially become compassionate places and literally to change the conversation and change the story there in those places. So I would suggest there's a, there's a tool and an opportunity for each of our communities, whether we're a, a small rural community or a big city, and we have examples of both with the Compassionate Action Network, for each of us in our communities to, uh, to more than flirt with compassion, to actually warmly embrace and have public conversations about what that would look like if fully expressed in our communities. And then a second tool really quickly, I don't know that I can be quick when I promise, so I'll try once again, is gross national happiness. I know from a recent public talk that that many folks involved in transition are aware of what's happening with gross national happiness, which is an alternative to measuring progress in terms of GDP, which insanely counts car accidents and hospitalizations and divorces and illnesses as positive um, for the bottom line of a country or a community because it contributes to economic growth. And obviously, we can do better than that. Gross national happiness provides 10 different domains of well-being that we can track individually and as communities. And another organization that I'm involved with is called the Happiness Initiative. Um, links to the Happiness Initiative and CAN International, by the way, are on the resource page associated with this call. The Happiness Initiative has the only thus far online survey implementation of gross national happiness and you can take it, your family can take it, your community can take it, and your community can see overall, how are we doing? Are we strong here? Are we relatively less strong there? Uh, what is the story that we can tell around that? And how might we change that story to be one in which all of us are experiencing greater and greater levels of well-being? So there are some profound social technologies that are happening now. The global compassion movement is happening now. The global movement for happiness and well-being is happening now, and we can engage with that very, very productively uh, as part of the great turning. With that, I'm complete. Wow. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was rich. Um, Ron uh, from, Lopez uh, from Lopez Island, Island. You have your hand up again. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, this is Kay, and one thing, we, we're creating a story here on like we, everyone on our island of 2,500 people are part of transitions, whether they know it or not. And um, we're really seeing ourselves as networking 42 really great nonprofits that are going here so that they have a sense of wholeness. Um, so when Ron told you the story about the procession of the species, that is but done by, we're not doing that, somebody else is doing it, but we're kind of, telling the story like, well, that's how we're building community. Uh, one of the things we've recently done is we, we get together for this call and have a meal afterwards, lunch, and then have ideas. And um, so that's one thing. The other, we have a monthly potluck and uh, everyone's invited, but we are, we've been spending a lot of time looking at local financing. Um, there's one of our guilds, we're going to steal that name from that call last week, is uh, the local financing group. So this week we're having a credit union from the mainland come over. They got so excited, they're sending over their whole staff and seeing about people, you know, getting it in an area of four counties where we're, we're possibly investing. But we're also looking at a model that's over in Port Townsend, which is called LION, L-I-O-N, and having someone next month to talk to us about that. So. And then just um, the real challenge is getting it out to the community and mapping our resources so that the whole community gets uh, what we're up to and there's nothing required of them other than if they're interested. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Kay. Um, 
And back to um, our our wonderful, uh, inspiring presenters. Um, any other thing that you want to say that might spark some more comments or questions? This is Dwayne, and uh, what comes up for me is um, once again, uh, stories may seem uh, inconsequential, inconsequential. Um, but as we move into a time of transition further and further, and uh, we see things begin to break down, we're going to be between stories. And to the extent that we don't have a story for the future, a narrative that really makes sense for us as a community, instead of pulling together, we're, we're going to pull apart. And so one of the most powerful things that we can do, Jeff alluded to this, uh, in terms of the levels of uh, intervention within a system, within a community, uh, one of the most powerful things that we can do is very subtle. And it's not for us to tell a story, but rather is to invite the community tell, to tell its own story. And there are tools of invitation uh, where you can ask a community, well, um, to what extent is this community really in, a, in uh, maturing? Is it growing up? And, and what does it look like as it matures into a new way of relating to uh, sustainability and a new way of a more compassionate relationship with the rest of the folks there in the community and so on? Um, so there are many narratives that, that communities can begin to take to explore their own sense of identity. And we've just started to touch on those uh, narrative possibilities. Claire gave us a bunch of wonderful examples. Uh, so let me ask, uh, Jeff, do we have um, a, web, the, a web URL where people can go to to get most of this uh, information? Or is that on the Transition US site, or where's the resource for us? So on the greattransitionstories.org website, uh, there is about to be, because I'm about to make it so, a link right at the top of the home page that will take you to the, the resources for this call. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to navigate there. And perhaps Caroline could add a link as well to the uh, Transition US landing page for this call. Yes, we certainly can. And Claire, also, you wanted to say something, and then we have um, Janice Lynn to go to as well. So Claire? That's great. Yeah, just to add on to uh, what Duane was talking about just now, um, this is, these are Duane's own words, but we're, as we were prepping for this call, we were talking about this. Duane, Duane said, you know, listening people into their own awakening. And I, I wanted to um, respond to the, you know, the point about um, stories and, and, you know, that may not have traction with a different subset of the community, and the importance of listening there. Um, as we talk about that here in Shawarmigan Bay, one of the things we're realizing is, you know, the words are not about sustainability. They're not about um, uh, thriving. Um, they're not about um, environmentalism. They're about um, self-determination and self-reliance. Uh, they're about freedom. Uh, those are the those are the buzzwords that um, we're starting to reclaim. I guess you could say. Uh, so that was one point. The other quick point was just uh, the tools available to to get that listening to happen. Uh, there's a lot out there. Uh, people may may already be aware of things like World Cafe um, and unconferencing. Uh, unconferencing is a process where you get a, a group of people together based on a theme like you just like you would do for a conference, except the people themselves set the agenda and 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 it runs uh, very free flowing within a structure if that makes any sense there's a people pick their own topics and they they uh, facilitate a conversation about those topics and it really lets the wealth of the community emerge and a lot of listening happens at those kinds of events um, in a way that doesn't happen with a typical sort of uh, conference or um, summit kind of event great thank you i wanted to um janet Janice Lynn has her hand up, and we'll go to you next, Janice, and then we'll do a final go-round with the presenters for closing comments. So Janice, to you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, I have a specific thing that's related to my locale. Um, I've been 
uh, well, first of all, we're involved, a lot of the transitioners are involved in um, <clears throat> dealing with uh, fracking in our area, which um, has turned in a kind of, into a polarized kind of um, debate. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak to the idea of using story to to uh, ease polarization and uh, to get communication going and how that might look to, to do that with something that's so fractious, so to speak, uh, as fracking. Wonderful. Yes, yes. This is Dwayne. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of research trying to figure out this very kind of, of issue and what comes up again and again. And I've seen this in my direct experience working in government and, and such. Uh, people have an underlying unspoken story often. And, um, and then you come along with policies. And you, it might be a policy for climate or energy or whatever. But if that policy conflicts with their unquestioned, unspoken story, it's just not going to work. And so then... Um, what I have discovered over the years is, uh, is at the level of community, if you say, well, let's, instead of a policy to do something about transportation or to energy or, or climate, say, well, how do we build our community? What do we do to build up the well-being, the strength, the resilience, uh, the capacity of our community to live in freedom and self-reliance or whatever the language might be so important? Uh, and that community building impulse um, really reaches down, if you look at the Maslowian scale of psychology, being and becoming, you know, the, the, that is a, is a deep evolutionary impulse of community building, and that and will bring people together. And then out of that, you can begin to find common ground, and from that common ground, those policies that you're speaking about. Uh, that would be my just quick reply. Thank you. Thanks for that, Dwayne. And Jeff and Claire each have a comment. So Jeff, first to you. Sure. Well, I actually encountered just in the last day an example that speaks exactly to the question. Uh, and I found that as a result of a report that was published in December called Collective Futures, How Projections About the Future of Society Are Related to Actions and Attitudes Supporting Social Change. And that title is not entirely transparent, but what the net of it is, is that scientists are finding that visions of a benevolent future, a benevolent future society, motivate reform. And there's a specific example of how a conservative city in Kansas, Salina, Kansas, uh, where there was a lot of uh, disagreement around climate change, I suppose acrimonious disagreement, um, w was able to find common ground and change the story to one of conserving energy, adopting renewable sources of power in order to uh, improve the city. Uh, so there was another way of uh, to en enhancing the city, and I'm not sure exactly how that played out, but I can send the links. Actually, they're already included on the wiki page to both the, uh, the research study and the layperson's article that goes into more detail about how that, how that was uh, successfully implemented in Salina, Kansas. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. And Claire, you wanted to mention something? Yeah, um, and Jeff, I can't wait to read that article. <laughs> so we, we're, we're dealing with a very similar dynamic here in Chuamagan Bay. We're not dealing with fracking, but we're dealing with mining. Um, and um, the Pinocchio Reed, if you get a chance to hear any of those stories, if you can replicate something like that in your community um, without even having an agenda um, about the um, uh, general direction of the stories, just the fact that the, the community got together to tell stories about the value of the Pinocchis, um, widened the group, and, and tamed some of the polarization. Um, and, and I would say that we are right on the edge of that polarization uh, and, and working really hard to, not to have it devolve that direction. But um, so having events um, as, as that, that you can you know, as much as possible not have the agenda be about even mining specifically or fracking specifically, but about the value of the place um, would help. And um, the other thing that we're doing, I'm on the board for the local sustainability uh, 
nonprofit here uh, is to is to approach the issue sideways. So um, because the people who really want the mine are are really concerned about jobs and really concerned about the future of their kids in the community, we can address those things. And so there's been this huge surge of um, tools for local economic development, conversation. Um, there's a presentation next week about local investment and um, uh, time sharing and, and you know, all of the tools that go with local economies. And uh, so that seems to have helped also dampen the polarization. Um, as, and, 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 and so long as the, we can keep talking about things in terms of shared values that that the ones that we know about so far um, that has helped enormously. So again, those values are you know the care of living here um, and and the sense of self-reliance. Um, those things uh, speak to everybody here. Thank you so much, Claire and Jeff and Dwayne. And now I want to um, turn it back to you just for closing comments. And uh, starting with you, Dwayne, uh, closing comments for today. Great. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, <clears throat> my, my, my comment, very simple. Uh, our story is our future. Our story is our future. Right now we're between stories. We're lost. Uh, one of the most powerful things that we can do to take a step forward is to tell a new story. And it's time to take courageous action in what seems like perhaps inconsequential, but it's really a profound shift in the collective uh, understanding of who we are, what we're doing, where we're going. So um, uh, small steps taken now, 10 years from now, as we move into a time of profound transition, will, will, will bear wonderful fruit. So I really encourage everyone to, um, to step up and tell your stories. Uh, that's my contribution. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Jeff? Well, I'm not sure I can improve upon all of this deliciousness, but it feels that we are feels like we are at a profound cusp where we're recognizing there's a trim tab in consciousness, and that is the story we tell. And we can begin to work that seemingly small, so subtle lever and very quickly realize enormous whole systems changes starting with ourselves, whether it's an individual healing or a family dynamic, uh, then our communities, and then the larger society. And I see it working. I see so many examples of how it's working. And I believe that uh, Transition Towns is right in the middle of this, uh, this transformation. So thank you all. Uh, I look forward to continuing to uh, swim in the river with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. And on to you, Claire. All right, thank you. This has just been a delight. Um, I guess the two things I'd end with is just to affirm um, what's always been part of the transition towns, which is that it's easier to work towards the vision of what we want rather than work against what we don't want. Um, we just uh, end up feeding that scenario far too much power when we do that. Um, and so um, just to affirm the idea of the working towards the vision, which is the story. Uh, and then lastly, uh, just to give you all a little bit of homework, go out and talk to somebody you've never talked to before sometime this week. <laughs> Great. Lovely. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dwayne and Jeff and Claire and the participants today.